As we move more into the substance of this oracle from God to his people Israel, we begin to see some of what it might be that prompted him to send this message to them. We begin to see that he is not pleased with how they are relating and responding to him. He has expressed his love to them. He's asking for love in return. It begins like this in verse 6. It says, as a son honors his father and a slave his master. If I'm a father, where is the honor due me? If I'm a master, where is the respect due me? Says the Lord Almighty. Strong words, and maybe at first it's hard to hear this as having to do with a dynamic of love, but God says, I'm I'm a father. Now, maybe some of us don't have a great relationship with our father, or maybe he isn't in our lives. It could be hard to, to think of this as a a comforting way to relate to God, but we see throughout scripture that God is that perfect father who cares for his children, is devoted to their well-being, and he says, since I'm a father, where is the respect that that kind of father is due? He then goes on to say, if I'm a master, where is the master, where is the respect that I'm due as a master? Now, this one's hard for us to hear, of course, because a lot of things come to our mind when we think of the master-slave relationship, but it's important for us to understand that in the time of Malachi, slavery was not based on ethnicity, and it was not a lifetime imprisonment. People could work their way out of slavery. Some people chose to stay in slavery because of such a great working relationship that they had with their master. So it's probably appropriate in our context to think of a boss and employee relationship. And a perfect boss, they care about the well-being of their employees, they they seek their good, and similarly, they expect that their employees are are dedicated to them and, and work hard. And God is saying, I love you. Show me that you love me. Now, as we move through the text, we find out what it is that he's getting at here in how they are not expressing their love appropriately to him. He says, it is you priests who show contempt for my name. But you ask, how have we shown contempt for your name? By offering defiled food on my altar. But you ask, how have we defiled you? By saying that the Lord's table is contemptible. When you offer blind animals for sacrifice, is that not wrong? When you sacrifice lame or diseased animals, is that not wrong? Try offering them to your governor. Would he be pleased with you? Would he accept you, says the Lord Almighty? So here we see what the issue is, that the people and their priests are bringing sacrifices to God that are diseased, are wounded, are basically dead already. Might as well give those animals as an offering to God. Maybe we have some healthy animals, but well, those will cost us something. We'll lose something from our our economic status if we offer him a good animal. Let's give him one that's not really good for anything anyway. Perhaps some of these animals couldn't even be eaten or or used to to breed in their flock. So they, they say, let's give that one to God. Now, in Exodus, Deuteronomy, Leviticus, we have very specific commands to not do this. And at some level to simply say, if God says don't do it, then we don't do it. That's an appropriate way to relate to God and his law. But why isn't this what we're supposed to do. Well, God wants to see, do we have in our hearts an authentic affection for him? Do we we see him as as worthy of, of our best, of the best of what we have? See, we find out farther in the passage here that it's not just that they don't have a better sacrifice to give and God is here being too demanding. No, we find out in fact they have other options. Look at what it says starting in verse 12. But you profane it, my name, by saying the Lord's table is defiled and its food is contemptible. And you say, what a burden. And you sniff at it contemptuously, says the Lord Almighty. When you bring injured, lame, or diseased animals and offer them as sacrifices, should I accept them from your hands, says the Lord? Cursed is the cheat who has an acceptable male in his flock and vows to give it, but then sacrifices a blemished animal for the Lord animal to the Lord. For I am a great king, says the Lord Almighty, and my name is to be feared among the nations. He's saying, you actually have something better that you could give me, but you're withholding that. And you need to hear that I'm a great king. Now that is a strong thing for God to say, but each and every one of us have to decide in our hearts, is God worth our best? Is he worth the best of our energy, the best of our devotion, the best of our creativity? 
He's the one who made us. He's the one who is saving us. He is the one who's given us every good thing we've ever experienced in life. Is it such a big thing for him to ask, for him to say, give me some of your best? And he has actually said elsewhere in scripture that it's not really about the sacrifices themselves that he is that he's caring so much about. God tells us in Deuteronomy 6, and Jesus, Jesus reaffirms it on a couple of occasions in the Gospels, that the greatest of all the commands is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your strength, to love him with all the best of who you are as a person. These sacrifices are merely a tangible expression of that authentic kind of love. In fact, God goes so far in Hosea 6 to say, I desire mercy, not sacrifices. I desire acknowledgement of God more than the flesh of an animal. These things are, are nothing to him. It's, it's a matter of what is in our heart and mind. Do we have it within us to give him our best? Because he's given us his best. As we will see through the sacrifice system, God will ultimately bring about a greater sacrifice. These animals can't really deal with the sin of the people. They can defer it. They can delay the judgment, but we need a better sacrifice. Well, who provided that sacrifice for us? God himself. We understand now that even the best of our sacrifices wouldn't be enough to deal with our deepest problem, which is sin and death. But yet God has given us his best. John 3, 16, God so loved the world that he gave his son. God came even nearer to us than he had come to, to the people in the, in the wilderness when he gave them his law on Mount Sinai. He came closer than the presence of God being in the temple. He came to us as flesh and blood, as one of us. He lived among us, he lived a perfect life, and he gave his life in our place. God is asking for us to have a heart that sees he's been willing to give us our be his best, should we, give us, should we give him our best in response? Hebrews chapter 13, verse 15 says, Through Jesus, therefore, let us continually offer to God a sacrifice of praise, the fruit of lips that openly profess his name. It's not any longer through the lamb on the Passover once a year that we show him our, our dedication to him. It's not through the blood that's scattered around the temple on the Day of Atonement. It's through the perfect blood of Jesus that we now profess praise to his name every day, in everywhere, in every place. And it's fascinating to look back at our text in Malachi and to see situated within this accusation of these bad sacrifices comes an appeal for the grace of God. If we go back towards the middle in verse 9, it says, Now plead with God to be gracious to us. With such offerings from your hands, will he accept you, says the Lord Almighty? Oh, that one of you would shut the temple doors so that you would not light useless fires on my altar. I'm not pleased with you, says the Lord Almighty. I will accept no offering from your hands. My name will be great among the nations. For where the sun rises to where it sets, in every place incense and pure offerings will be brought to me, because my name will be great among the nations, says the Lord Almighty. We see now in retrospect that these sacrifices were preparation. They were a way of relating to God to show, to show uh, our affection for him in tangible ways. Well, now, anywhere and everywhere, we can live a life of sacrifice of a declaration of praise. And in fact, right here in Malachi 1, it is predicting that a, that a time will come where the where wherever the sun rises, there will be people who are lighting incense, who are professing the name of the Lord. And here we now are. In the ministry of Jesus in John 4, he meets a woman who wants to know, where do I need to go to worship God? Is it on this mountain where I live in Samaria or is it that mountain in Jerusalem that the Jews worship at. And Jesus says, a time is coming and is now here where you don't need to worship on that mountain or this mountain. You, God wants worshipers who worship in spirit and in truth. And so for this time in, in Malachi, the people needed to bring an offering that showed God, I'm willing to give you my best. But I want to ask you, in our time and in the ways that God has called us to, are you willing to give God your best? Are you willing to wake up in the morning and say, God, I give you the best of my energy today. I give you, I give you the best of my problem solving. I give you the best of, 
of my heart and my focus. I give you the best of, of every decision I will make today. I, every interaction I have with another person, I wanna give you my best in that moment. It's about a heart that says, God has given me everything. It's the least I can do to respond to him with the honor, the respect, and the love that he deserves. Will you show that kind of affection to him today?